my name is Dan L. Hess, and I'm uh, currently the operations manager here at a and uh, Effective December 1st, I will be moving into the position of chief curator here at the museum. Um, yeah, something I'm very excited about. I appreciate that. So, um, yeah, I'd like to all welcome you to this, this conversation with me. I, like I said, I'm sure you're going to be rewarded. Um, Randall Webster, our current co-director and curator, is leaving to move on to more uh, exciting projects for himself. Uh, Randall is, I've had nothing but great experience with, with Randall. He's extremely gifted and generous. Uh, uh, he will be greatly missed here at a and but we wish him the best, you know. Um, you know, I announced my moving on to uh, the chief curator position on Instagram yesterday, and the outpouring of love and support was incredibly moving. So, uh, you know, to all of you out there, my, my deepest thanks for that. Uh, sometimes social media can be uh, a warm and kind of fuzzy place with a soul, and I experienced that yesterday. Um, that's not always the way it is, but yesterday I felt that. So, uh, in addition to my change of position here at A&H, we also have some other staff present uh, that I really need to acknowledge. Um, Danielle Thomas, she should be in here in a minute. She's finishing up a financial meeting online. Um, she is now <clears throat> moving into the position of sole executive director. Um, she really is instrumental in um, us being where we are right now, she kind of helped us through the, uh, the pandemic and all those, those tough times that we all went through. So, and she really has a deep concern and care for the, the well-being of the staff. And uh, I think that's that's one of the reasons we like we can uh, move forward from this point. You know, um, Jesse Van Pelt. Hi, Jesse. Wave your hand there. She is moving on to the position of director of advancement, and Jesse has been with A for a long time, and she has a great love for the institution, and I know she will make super great strides in her role. So, congratulations to you, Jesse, for that. Um, Katie Benson. Hi, Katie. Katie is our new exhibitions manager. That was a title that she had before, but her responsibilities have expanded um, from her previous ones. Um, she's getting paid more as well, so Katie's super happy about that. Um, Katie is our resident historian and the knower of all things uh, relating to our founder, J. Andre Smith, founder, J. Andre Smith. So um, I'm happy, really happy, that she will finally get to tell the stories that she's been wanting to tell of all those people that are involved in the conception of this institution. Um, Iron Deton, did I say that correctly? Oh, that's so good. I thought I was gonna butcher that. <clears throat> is our new marketing manager, and he is really brilliant. He's responsible for the great changes you see on social media. His videos on our artists are really engaging and they're really wonderfully done, so thank you for that. Um, Prajakta Deshpande, did I say that right, Prajakta? <laughs> I, I, ha I was privileged to be at a talk last night that Prajakta that Pajaka gave, and I almost wish I didn't go because she did such a good job. I felt like I was never going to match up to the excellence that I saw last night. Um, Prajaka is our resident uh, ICOMOS, uh, which is the International Council on Monuments and Sites. Um, she is our International Exchange Program intern. Um, ICOMOS is an advisory board that uh, uh, to UNESCO, which I, I, you all know. Um, she is from Belgaum, is that correct, India? And she will be returning home next week, so please thank her for all the incredible work she's done. Yeah, she's developed a plan for us to move forward, a really ingenious plan for us to move forward with the conservation of this historic site, so. Um, uh, but we haven't all gathered together for this. We're, we're here to hear from Mir Martinez about her work and her working method. Mayor is one of our new AIAs. Uh, she shares our founder, J. Andre Smith Studio 13 with her partner, partner fellow AIA, Leo Cordovi. Leo, welcome. Uh, the three remaining AIAs are Damon DeWitt in Studio 7, Audrey Hope in Studio 6, and MJ Torricampo in Studio 12. <clears throat> okay, so to the important thing while we're here today. So Mayor Martinez is an interdisciplinary artist specializing in sculptural painting. Her work dissects dominance, aggression, and power dynamics through the lens of culturally enforced binary system. Uh, she has received her BFA in painting and her BA in art history from the University of Central, University of Central Florida. Uh, 
The way I format these conversations uh, is that I come up with questions and observations about the artist's work from looking at them, uh, talking to them, and looking at their work. And uh, the artist is not privy to these conversations or has any knowledge of them prior to our conversation tonight. Is that correct? Um, <laughs> but Mayor has kindly agreed to this, which is uh, courageous on her part. There's no gotcha questions. We just want to kind of have some spontaneous conversation. Um, like I said, Mayor has finally opened her studio afterwards for visitors. So uh, on that note, please welcome Mayor Martinez. Hello everyone, thank you so much for having me. And I'm so thankful to Maitland for making this possible. Um, having a studio space in Central Florida where it can exist um, in the context of a art history museum is absolutely amazing. And this is like an unparalleled opportunity. So I'm really to be here. And I'm excited to talk to you. I'm excited too. We, we had such a great kind of uh, spontaneous talk in your studio that day. So hopefully we can just recapture some of that. Okay, we'll just work on that. We'll work on that. <clears throat> um, so one thing I think you'll be kind of intrigued about, or just you'll get a, a laugh out of, is I was looking over my notes for the talk, and the, one of the things I noticed was I wrote this, Mar doesn't run from history, right? Ooh. It should be Mar because I didn't put the so Mayor doesn't run from history. Um, I think that's going to be the overarching theme for tonight's talk. Uh, I was super impressed when I um, sat down with Mayor that she uh, she's really dealing with these old world problems in a new and uh, kind of um, contemporary way. Um, she hasn't run from issues that a lot of the uh, world leaders today have run from. She seems to kind of embrace the struggle and embrace the challenge, and she is um, she is uh, manifesting that in her studio. And when I was in there, I kind of felt that. I felt like that this was a, a really honest wrestling was going that was going on with uh, these issues that were not just contemporary, but that have been around for a long time. Okay, so my first kind of thought was, and this is where I just want to, this is, I think, where we began our talk in the studio was, it has to begin with mom and dad. <laughs> <laughs> so just please, uh, I think that's really the starting point. And it's so honest that you went there. A lot of artists try to disassociate themselves from their personal history, like they just kind of spontaneously, uh, you know, arrived on the planet. But you are, you're not shying away from those conversations that were taking place. So please. I mean, nobody is, you know, sprouting from like a sprig of sea foam or whatever and just arising. Like we all came from somewhere and someone. And my work is very rooted to my own personal history. I know some artists like to operate outside of that. But for me, I find that um, my personal experience has deeply informed my practice. And um, just for context, a lot of my work, I draw upon themes from a multicultural heritage. My dad is a Cuban immigrant, and my mother is, um, her family's from Syria, so, and they came over. So I'm a first slash second generation American, and the kind of dual pull from my family's history has really shaped the way that I see the world. Um, and I feel like I was definitely raised with more of like um, an, an Arab context, just because like in my family, the culture was passed down mostly through my mother, through religion, a little bit of language, and also food which is normally the way that like religion, uh, that um, culture is passed down. So, and that and, has affected my art. And you had mentioned too that your, um, your mother was Jewish, right? Mm -hmm. And she converted to Christianity recently, is that correct? But you, 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 <clears throat> you spoke to me about this kind of like beautiful, I don't know, I don't know the right way to put it, but you, you were saying that this, this conflicting energies were going on. Right, is that correct? Definitely. Um, the correct terminology is messianic. So people that um, convert to Christianity but still hold like a lot of Jewish tradition, they consider themselves messianic Jews. So there, it gets a little complica complicated and fuzzy when it comes to choosing like, okay, how do I partake in religion while still preserving cultural aspects? And it gets a little jumbled. But um, they're definitely, I consider them people of faith. Okay, so this was one of the interesting thing that, things that I wrote down in my book uh, when I left Mars, uh, Mayor's studio. So, okay, there. 
praying with your eyes open. So let's have it. Okay, so this, um, I'm actually gonna be talking to you guys a little bit about um, a new body of work that I'm developing, and it's kind of a strange situation to talk about work that's not quite finished yet, so you're getting to see it in the middle of like the process. But um, a phrase that's been rattling around in my head a lot lately is praying with my eyes open. And I've been thinking a lot about what it means to basically do that, because um, prayer, it's this ritualistic act, but to pray with your eyes open implies that it's um, just that, you're reenacting a ritual instead of it being an act of faith. So it's like a hollow reciting of a And it process. does it does reference this one specific piece too, is that correct? Yeah, this is the only one from that series that is actually like fully fleshed out. It was the first one and I'm kind of developing this body of work where these figures are kind of uh, covered in textiles that are really important to like my Syrian heritage that I grew up with around my house. So I'm kind of referencing these like Byzantine colors almost, or um, when you look at like a, a Syrian rug or sometimes they're called Oriental rugs, they have like this intense patterning. But I've been thinking a lot about what it means to basically pray with your eyes open. So it's, I, I think that in my family, even though I would consider myself a religious, there's still this um, pressure to preserve tradition. Um, so I'm at a place where I'm trying to decide what I want to partake in willingly and what I don't want to. And um, I'm, I'm selecting which rituals I want to keep and preserve in my life. Right. So. right. You know, the one thing I think it, it's important to, real, to talk about is, um, you know, I had a friend stay with me recently who was, um, he's Israeli, he was in the Israeli army, and he would be in my house and he would be on the phone talking to people, you know, in, in the and I would be like, I realized I had no, absolutely no concept of what was actually going. You know, we have this kind of com concept in the U.S. like we understand the Middle East, and we really don't. You know what I mean? Especially the, the situation in Syria and stuff like that. So I think the fact that you're dealing with these issues in your work and bringing them to light can spark conversations for people that definitely are in need of some uh, enlightenment as far as that area goes. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the situation is definitely complex, and I don't think I'm prepared to like sum summarize that right now. Right, but, right. Um, and even the like the fabrics, I think that I'm choosing for this, like I just want to reference that they're um, tied to elements of prayer and religion. So, like in Judaism, you wrap yourself with a cloth for prayer, and then in um, like Islam, people pray on their prayer rugs. And my family is split between like the three like major Judeo-Christian religions. So it's complex, like even like where my family comes from, we are kind of split down that three-part middle. Right. Yeah. Okay, you ready for your first kind of I'm, I'm ready. question? Okay, I appreciate you being so graceful too. Okay, so the first question, uh, Mayor, is uh, it centers for me when I looked at your work on the concept of the, the fragment, especially with regard to pieces of antiquity. So these fragments give us hints as to the body or the culture, but we as the viewer are required to do some work. We have to put the whole story together. Was making the viewer responsible for the narrative something that you considered in your work? For this body of work, absolutely. Like I always go into creating, I think I work backwards in a sense, like I tend to write like essays to myself of what I want something to mean, and then I create the work that's just my process, whereas other people go the opposite they make and then they write about it afterward. But um, for this one, I wanted to kind of conceal the figure and, and keep it a little bit more hidden, where in other areas of my work, it's been a little bit more overt to the message. Right, so. right. And I think this, this piece is an example kind of of that series, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is one of the more developed works in progress, but you can kind of see how it's a little bit uh, further along than some other pieces you're about to show. But it's. Um, just because of the fact that there's no like figure or um, like animal or other placeholder that you can project an identity and a story into, it's a little bit more obscure. And that's all painting really is, or any sort of art making. It's, right, it's right. a mirror, or maybe like a dartboard that we can kind of throw stuff onto as the viewer and project ourselves and see what sticks. So what it means to me may not be as specific as what it means to you, but I hope to kind of convey this image of a struggle underneath. Correct, right, right. And I think you, um, I'm going to go back to like 
these images. And I, I kind of love this, I don't know why, I was, but it also, for me, it, it kind of resembles the, the uh, canvases that you're working on, these kind of cut out, right? So you're only giving us, you're giving us this very, because it's, it's painterly and it's lush, so you're giving us kind of uh, more of visually of the story. But you're still leaving it up to me to be like, okay, I need to, I need to do some work on my. Now that I have to give you credit for that because when I, a lot of art I see nowadays tries to be clever and conclude the conversation immediately. It's almost like that kind of um, that real estate kind of mantra where you you want to kind of sell the whole thing in like six seconds. You know, you have six seconds of somebody's approval or somebody's. Concentration, if you know what I mean? Lucky. If you're lucky, yeah. right, if you're lucky, right? So, but when I was in your studio, I didn't feel that. I felt like you were welcoming the, the artist to kind of sit with these and, and kind of say, okay, I, I want to learn more about these because of their lushness and because, because of their. Thank you. you know. And I think it's interesting too that you said the word fragment in the first slides right. because the pieces that I make kind of are, since they are cut out, they are removed from their context, they do serve as these fragments of a narrative and that's one of the things I actually aim to accomplish by like removing them from the confines of a canvas. These pieces just, if you haven't seen them in person, they are um, hand cut on wood so I use a jigsaw to kind of rip them out of that protective space. So, and I think that that can speak a lot towards like themes of consent as well because they're non-consensually being removed and that applies especially to like my figures. Can you elaborate on that because that's something you, you really spoke to very well in the studio that day. The fact that you, now it's funny because when I look back at artists that I had known, you know, in you know my, my art history, whatever, um, the only artist that I found that kind of liberated the painting from that rectangular canvas were women. Like, uh, one was like Elizabeth Murray, like that's a great example. You know, even though she's an abstract painter, she still created these kind of um, fragments of abstraction like you do, you know. But you were talking about liberating the painting from its confines, is that correct? Some more so, some are more liberated, whereas others are more forcibly removed. Forcibly Just removed, okay, right, context. right. But I do think that there's, they're still paintings, but they're also very much objects when they're removed. So then you can speak about objectification or things that operate that you can suddenly exert power over because they're not these, you know, right, safe right. space, like like a, a scenic painting of something that has its place to exist. So these are, in my mind, they're paintings or objects that are trying to justify their own space and take up their own space and existence because they've been removed from that place of safety. So it's funny, that that means, because um, I, I kind of hang around with painters or I, you know, I've known painters, and um, the one thing that they were concerned about in kind of a funny way was uh, this one guy I knew, he, he called his paintings dysfunctional children, that he just wanted to get them to a place where they were strong enough to go out in society on their own. But you, in, in that context, you're really, you really have to establish these in their, in their kind of being, right? And you know, like, does that make sense? Like if you're gonna, if you're gonna forcibly remove something from its constraints, then you have to embolden it with this kind of identity where it can exist on its own. Does that make sense? In a way, yeah, that's a really, empowering spin on it and I, right. and I appreciate that because I want them to be able to exist I want them to be able to take up space like I have this series of um, paintings of rabbits where they're like these smaller bodies that are I, I view them as more restricted from actualizing their power like from a very binary system they're these smaller wow. objects and I was painting these more um, overt depictions of aggression with like Predator animals like dogs engaged in conflict. You will see some of those photos coming oh, up. Oh, okay. So am, I, am I yeah, ruining the plot? No, no, please, no, no, please. If we'll elaborate on that, and then we will get to those images. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so context for you guys. But um, so the the rabbits there. I tend to paint everything life sized. I like to keep them, so it feels. I'm not aiming for realism in my representation, but I think when something exists in the size that it does exist in real life, it's like you have to kind of confront it for what it is. And so these small bodies of the rabbits, they, they feel more fragile in comparison to these rougher, bigger, stronger 
paintings of these animals and humans in conflict. Right, right. But because they like they come off the wall, um, like a, a five inch painting can consume a massive amount of space depending on how it's lit. So I like to kind of play with that idea of conceptually and like literally taking up space. So Interesting. That's like I guess a more empowering spin for them because I like they are my babies. No, they right, no, exactly. I mean, they are, they kind of are, you know, they're your children. Well, that's a good segue into the next question I have then, so. Um, okay, so in old master drawings, the part of the page that was left blank or empty was almost as important as the a part with the realized drawing. The composition of the page hinted at an open narrative where the key elements could find breath in a larger meaner context beyond the borders of the page. Does that blank wall surrounding your painted elements come into play in a similar fashion? Absolutely. You know, I take a lot of notes from, even though I consider myself a sculptural painter, not a sculptor, I take a lot of notes from the way um, sculpture that is not like on the floor is presented. Right. And you can almost like paint with shadow. But I also think a lot about um, in the Torah, there's like, the, the text is black and there's the white space as well. And some scholars say that the empty space that's around the actual text is just as poetic and just as important because it's the things that can't be known. And it's referred to black fire on white fire. Oh, that so, is really beautiful. Wow, yeah. that's great. It's funny because this is one of my favorite, oh, and it reminded me of your work. It's a, I think it's a drawing by Constable. Um, but um, it really, all this activity and this intensity really hints at something going on, but it's not, the, the narrative is not kind of finished over there. So it leaves it open. And I was thinking of this drawing in relation to your work, you know. I know that the, the animals are not engaged in this kind of, you know, referential kind of conversation between themselves. Like, um, this is a good example. But it reminded me of the kind of, that the wall doesn't come into play with your work a lot, you know. And I didn't see that right away. And I think when I was thinking about your work and looking back at these old master drawings, um, I kind of saw that that kind of breadth that, like you said, and that's a perfect example with you when you're talking about the, you know, the scripture is, is that there's kind of a breath that's needed so that the, uh, you know, like the, the sense or the narrative is not concluded, you know. Does that make sense? Or? Absolutely. Okay. And I think it's really important for images like these ones where there is such, I think, a narrative. Like, I don't right. want to come to all the conclusions for the viewer because I have a lot of paintings where they're locked in this, like, almost Ouroboros cycle like Interesting. Right. these are actually called like pour le dieu which is like french for the madness of two but like i i so picture wait, can you say that the again? madness of two like i'm gonna hate it when people name like their work after in like a language they don't speak but oh, it was just so perfect <laughs> because like i do these these it's a, like being stuck in a binary no matter what it is when there's oh, such definitive right, thinking, right. you're stuck you're stuck forever and there's like this endless power struggle but i also wanted to feel a little poetic and beautiful and you can see kind of how like the shadows really come into play and then right. emphasize on a technical like level they emphasize the piece here's i i think this is the rabbit you're making reference mm -hmm. to right yeah 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 so they're these like like not lifeless they're not activated they're not activated bodies so, and I feel like they exist, like they're almost a little dreamlike, like right. lacking movement. So they feel a little bit more subdued and submissive versus the more aggressive binary. And it's funny, this also has a rich historical context of, um, you know, um, like even Dutch still life paintings mm -hmm. where they would display, you know, dead rabbits from the cat, from the hunt and all that stuff, you know, and, and um, I don't know. It, it it's it's great when you get a chance to sit with this for a while. It's funny because your work is so bold in one regard, but there are these kind of conceptual sensitivities that are going on that you, if you sit with it for a while, they really kind of come up to the surface. I mean, it's funny because you did these figurative works, and I hope we can elaborate on that. But um, like this is a Raphael drawing, you know. But again. Um, this compression, that's something that happens in your work, right? It's this compression of these figures into a space. But then around it, you know, it's kind of like this unrealized conversation taking place. I am like, so flattered by these references. <laughs> oh, that's good. No, I, it's really, honestly, it's, it's funny. I went home last night after to project this talk, and I, I had all these things kind of lined up that I was thinking or talking about. And I was like, you know what? And I, I started just going through my library. And I actually brought this book in for you if you wanted to look through it. Oh so, my gosh, yes. Yeah, yeah. 
No, but I mean, it was like, you know, there's something about that. Um, I, I, you know, for me, it's funny, we look back at historical artifacts and old master drawings and stuff like that, and we think, oh, we're, you know, we're kind of so advanced because we're conceptual now or something. But really, they were dealing with that whole, that whole uh, skill set as well. You know, they weren't just these, um, these great craftsmen. You know, their, their kind of mindset was like, I, I want to create space for this um, thought of what could these figures be existing in? What is the conversation that's taking place? It reminded me a lot of this work of yours, you know? Yeah, so this is the first of the, um, the Foil You series that I had started. Yes, this was before the dogs, Leo, correct? Okay, he remembers my timeline a little bit better than I do. But it's this is like, you know, the two figures are, they're entwined and I tried to keep it like open-ended about whether it was, you know, a, a sexual struggle, a playful struggle, a literal fight, but I, I also like that compression and this is life size, so it's about, I think, like six, six feet, but um, one of the things I try and channel in my other work, this is maybe more activated than the others, is getting that compression and the idea that the figures are like crunching and feeling constrained and not not existing and taking up the amount of space that they should. Right, so. right. You know, it's funny, I, I haven't written this in my questions, but it was something I was thinking of and I think I'd love you to, if you could. You know, the, the term, like I like how you, you know, said, I don't know exactly what the wording was again, but you said that you were, they were kind of locked in this endless um, non, no, in this endless binary mm -hmm. kind of conflict, right? So, so many people nowadays are, are kind of embracing this non-binary, right? But for you, you can never arrive at that point because your work, the strength of your work is from this conflict. Does that make sense? Like, do you think you'll ever get this conflict will have resolution? Or do you think it's gonna be, because like you're dealing with these, you know, incredible issues, right? The old world issues. And those old world issues <laughs> take a lot of time to, you know, to kind of realize and, and flesh themselves out if you're being honest with it. I mean, I would like to consider myself an optimist. I think on a good day, I'm an absurdist. I don't, I try not to like get stuck in this like doom and gloom mindset, but if I'm being honest, I think that just like humans are animals at the end of the day, and there's always going to be this intensity and this struggle. And like in our higher mind, we can, we have a facade that we can try and strengthen up and make things like, like strive towards equality and acceptance and a fluidity because that is what I want in my heart for things right, not to be right. so so binary there needs to be a middle ground there needs to be you know people giving and, and thinking outside of themselves but I think that there is definitely like when you look at humanity as a whole I, I well, don't know you know what the thing no but honestly I, I I have to commend you for that because no like like to arrive at that place of complete resolution or this complete non-binary is really honestly difficult you know I mean there's so many forces that are acting on us and I and I just kind of give you credit for realizing the forces that are acting on you personally and conceptually as an artist and trying to give them place in your work you know it's not easy you know what I mean it's like it, it kind of would be easier to kind of abandon that you know but um, when I sat in your studio, which is hopefully where we can all go soon, is um, there was that struggle going on, and it felt really honest. And for me, as a as a painter myself, you know, apart from my role here, um, honest is the greatest compliment I can pay somebody. You know, um, it's sad. I wish I saw it more going on. I, you know, I, I do see it. The AI is here, which I'm really excited about. This current group we have. Um, and our former groups as well, but um, you know when when you look out to these you know, art fairs and stuff like that, um, they kind of trouble me. You know, I mean, because it seems like that kind of honest conversation has been, you know, kind of cast aside for um, kind of instant gratification. You know, does yeah. that make sense? And is there honesty involved when it's about money? That's right, right. Not not to knock someone that wants to make money off their no, own. No, but, but it, I, right. yeah. I don't know, I can only speak for and create from my experience, and right. I've just noticed like a harshness. So these paintings of you as reacting to kind of the realities that I have seen, and like to circle back to kind of like my cultural background, like 
I don't necessarily know if the Middle Middle Eastern culture as a whole is known for um, flexibility. And right, I just right. That, no, it's true. You know, right. That's, that's just my, that's been my personal experience. And there are these very harsh and enforced sets of rules and, right. you know, gendered roles. And, you know, like, right. so that these are just kind of a reaction to that. But hopefully that will change for the better. I have hope. Well, that's good. That's good. Well, listen, I, I wanted to ask another question, but I knew some really smart people were showing up tonight. So I want to kind of open it up for some audience, audience questions. Ooh. So um, once Pat Green kind of gave me the <laughs> amen by posting the conversation of the talk last night, I felt like the Pope had kind of blessed me. And I, and I just wanted to kind of, you know, acknowledge that there was some, some people that were smart here, you know. And um, we want to give them place. And uh, so, listen, I I thank you so much for allowing me to just kind of ask those questions. I hope you felt like they were relevant. And I think that this has been awesome. Like, hey, anyone can memorize something or read off of like a sheet on the computer, which you know. But this this gives it a little bit more. I don't know, like energy that yeah, you well, can replicate. So this good, is going to be a very unique. Good. And listen, we'll, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, having these conversations with our fellow, uh, the other AIs as we go forward. Um, that'll probably be after January. I know Leo's going to be one of them, and um, Damon. Damon was here earlier. His Damon's wife just had a, a baby, so he is at home doing the doing the dad thing. And um, yeah, so let's let's just open this up for uh, some audience questions. And um, please feel free. I, I mean, obviously, Mayor is super uh, able to speak about her own work, so I wouldn't shy back from asking anything that you feel is uh, can, you know, kind of engaging her on a level. You know, I just would kind of feel free about it, so. Yes. Uh, I'm interested in, in how you, uh, uh, well, I guess, I, how you present it you know, like in, in what in what situations you present this, but also in whatever that is, the difference. It's it's very stunning to me the difference between the rabbit picture and the um, what is it the fox and the what is it called? Oh, that's the rabbit and uh, the other way. Yeah. There you go. Right. right. And those two who are these are so active in much more three D, right? And the they kind of look like dead rabbits, or you know, they're so flat. Um, it, it's like how I just want to hear you talk about those two and why you did them like that. You know, the, the meaning of the two and what you say about them. So uh, the first question was how I basically present these. Mm -hmm. So I obviously can exert a little bit more control, and isn't that what this is all about? It's 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 control issues, <laughs> but um, I have more control when it's. Um, in a solo exhibition, but thankfully in a lot of the group shows I've been able to partake in, uh, they've been very uh, receptive to my wants and needs for these pieces because they were made with the intention to have like um, proper lighting to cast a bigger shadow. You can kind of see the difference, like this one doesn't cast as much of a shadow just because of the way it was lit. Um, I was challenged at, at one of my exhibitions to kind of make them become like a Kara Walker-esque, um, Kind of explosion on the wall. I don't necessarily know if that was the most successful presentation because they were not made with that intention. But I actually have about like 20 rabbit clusters. Some of them are individual, and then I have a very, very big like cluster of like 30 rabbits kind of piled on top. So that's easier to arrange kind of in more of a conversation as one larger piece, um, if that answers your question. I mean, why the why is one active? and the other one so flat. So this one, I tried to create it a little bit more still and more subtle um, to draw people in more towards the actual technique of the paint. So this has, it's treated, it, you can't really tell in this photograph, but it has like hundreds and hundreds of tiny little brush strokes. So there's this really soft and gentle layering of paint that kind of contrasts that harder edge. And I wanted it to feel more still. Whereas the one of the animals that are in conflict, I wanted it to have, even though like there, are, it's always going to be a still image because it is on a rigid piece of wood. So there's a, there's a, a stagnance to that inherently. I wanted it to feel a little bit more overt. So with the other painting, 
that I have of the animals in conflict. Like I tried to emphasize the curling of the shadows, almost like a Renaissance. Have you ever seen a Renaissance painting of a lion? They've got that weird sure, curly yeah. hair. I tried to think about that in this piece. And I was also challenging myself to do more, um, I guess, elegant technical work with my jigsaw. So um, like that's all kind of removed. So it was just a, that was my intention for that piece. And I felt like it mimicked kind of the, the shape of the fur of the animal. So thank you, thank you. Do, the, do you see these as combatants in the conflict and then the rabbits as victims of the conflict? Um, that... As a person working in binary, I try not to think of that binary. I right. view these either in uh, like a struggle, it could be a dance almost because there is a grace, at least in that painting of the way that they're circling each other. Right, right. And I think that it, that almost shows like a distrust, like they, they've got like their, their heads kind of Right, Pass, right. Although they're not actively engaging, but the rabbits are definitely more submissive inherently. Right. And we also partner, like, uh, I guess, like, conceptually, rabbits are considered a more feminine animal, a more, you know, they're, they're a prey animal. Right, not, right. So it kind of worked with, if I'm going to really highlight a binary, like, that was the way I wanted to go. And then when I started working in, um, the fabric paintings, I kind of wanted to get away from overt representations of like, this is aggression, this is submission, this is something that's locked in so so deeply. So it's a little bit more ambiguous. It's funny, I didn't realize that until this woman asked the question, but these that are in conflict, they're, they're in conflict, they're actually the same species that are in conflict. So it's kind of interesting, they're not like different species of dogs that are in conflict, they're the same, That because that adds to the whole kind of dialogue of really, you know, a lot of that Middle Eastern thing, right? It's kind of this overlap between similar ideas, a lot of it's sameness, mm -hmm. and then there's this one defining little side tangent that separates, you know what I mean? Yeah, oh, and do you actually have, do you have the picture of the one, because I remember you had uh, brought up the, the I think Raphael drawing, do you have yeah. the, the painting that's like this? Oh, I don't know if no? you're Which okay. one, would that be of animals? Oh, it's in my, no, it's a figure, but it's in my studio, because I thought maybe I could okay, maybe we can, Yeah, the only figure representation I have is this one, yeah. Okay, um, well, I can just like tie this in briefly now that we're talking yeah, about Yeah, please, I mean, it'll be good for people to see it in your studio, yeah. Yeah, well, I have this, um, the very first series of figures I did, and I consider that one kind of ongoing. It's called um, Habibti, and it pictures these uh, figures that are very much like crouched, and, and, and they're kind of confined, and they almost look a little bit similar to the body posture you had in that drawing. And the reason why I made that work, I wanted to talk to my experience of how like, um, power is kind of exerted through language, and it's not always like, uh, violence is not always a big explosive act. Sometimes it's something that's like quiet and slowly builds. And there's the word habibti, it's like the feminine verb uh, version of habibi, which means like my beloved or like like, I, like the person I love. But it's, it's a way to make someone smaller and diminutive, at least it's the way that we used it kind of in like my family, so it's like um, exerting power under the guise of affection. Oh, so I was wow. trying to make these That's pieces loaded. like, right, right. yeah, smaller. So it's not always about like that initial act of violence. Interesting. So, yeah. Yeah, that that has a lot of layers to it, right? Mm -hmm. And that kind of like led into the rabbits. So they're they're more like con constrained and small figures that don't feel as empowered, I guess, in that moment. Well, that's great. I'm, I'm glad we're going to be able to see that one in your studio. Anybody else have a question? Probably, I feel like it's a blunt question after all of Kate's, <laughs> after all of your eloquence. <laughs> no, please. After all of your eloquence, but, um, What, like, what's my favorite color? <laughs> <laughs> I am going to ask about your colors, and I've thought about it all the way here, and the question still stands, and given the conversation that we've been having here for however long it's been, your colors are hard. They make me want to bite my fingers, and everything you paint is soft. And I'm really familiar <laughs> with your work. And that's interesting. I didn't even see. And that's great. Yeah, yeah. I'm painting carpets on top of people now, but it was just double soft. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if that's a question. So much <laughs> that's an interesting what's observation, what's and I'll take it because, like, one of my favorite things about a piece of art when I'm viewing it, I like the tactile experience. Like, and I love, like, I think I've told Leo this a million times. Like, I want to eat that paint. Like, I want to bite it. So I appreciate that. <laughs> that's right. Right. <laughs> Here, 
layers of your work, and specifically the color palette is not soft. Yeah, that's a really good observation. So one of the ways that I approach painting, I, I don't know if I said sorry, but like I, I like to, I paint in either a series of soft, soft glazes, like in oil, which takes a million years, but I like almost like that tedious process in conjunction to the like overt kind of explosive like way I cut them out, which is so fast. It's like, oh my God, if you don't watch out, you're gonna chop a finger off. Like, so there's like the, almost like a romantic layering of paint and the same thing with the softness of the fur and the colors. I kind of, I, I choose the color to fit whatever mood I want to convey. And this is the, this is like my first time really trying to combine and balance a lot of very bold, bold, bold colors with the textiles. So I feel like it's been a discovery process trying to balance all of these things because I work, I typically I work in a different way. But um, yeah, I would not consider my work in general to be soft. So I think that that's been conveyed. It's, it's hard to be soft when you're talking no, it's, about. It's not at all soft, right? mm -hmm. yeah. but it's interesting. I think it's been backed up here enough to continue to be like, okay, yeah, they are all like physically soft things, not yeah. sexually, but physically. Well, I guess like we're inherently comfort seekers as humans. Like we want, I think we crave as as humans, like we want like a womb like experience, like deep, 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 deep down, mm -hmm. and. With these fabric pieces, I'm thinking a lot about how um, there's like a, this inner struggle, but it's like protected maybe by heritage or by religion or ritual. It's something that's safe, but it's also could be smothering, keeping you away and distant, like a physical barrier from the outside world. So I don't know if the act of covering oneself up is like a strive towards safety or if it's a way to hide. So, is it comfort or is it hiding or is it both? So, I, I just have to say, I, at first I found it confusing, but I love that you don't label what everything is. You know? Thank you. you. You make us work for it. Right, it was what we, we spoke about earlier, yeah. right? Which is great, right? No way. Listen, treating the viewer like they're intelligent is something that is rare nowadays. It's really sad. A lot of artists that I know have feel like they have to force feed or serve, you know what I mean? Because they feel like if they serve the viewer, then the viewer will like them more and they'll be more attractive and they'll be more, you know, consumption will then happen and they'll be successful, right? And that's the danger of Jeff Koons. Right, exactly. Chew it up and spit it out. No, okay. it's exactly right, right? And, 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 so the funny thing is too, even with your like, I think the point that Richard brought up is really is really great because even in the like, I was like trying to figure out. I think when Richard sparked that this conversation, the even the drapery, which has a lot of that kind of feeling of that those old world fragments like we talked about. There's this kind of compression that's taking place. Like you're more than able in your your skill set as a painter to paint these kind of voluptuous, you know, billowing fabrics. But they're, they are kind of very compressed into that space that they're dealing with, right? It's like they, they are having to deal with that kind of like, uh, like there's not a lot of air in there, you know? Yeah. Does that make sense? They're heavy, like I want them to have movement, but yes, they're, not, they're yes. not like, right, you know, a right. summer garment. Right, it's kind of like, I think we were talking about this right earlier, Right. Even though they reference the body and this and that, they're they're still constrained within that space, you know. And that's why I thought of these and these fragments in relation to your work, you know. So, I think Katie, did you have a question? Yeah, it's kind of a comment slash questions back onto your um, Oriental rugs comments. I, I grew up in Southeast Asia, so Oriental rugs are that we have them in our house and everything. But I was wondering, you know, you were talking about the cutting out process of how it's kind of taken away from the wood that you're cutting out of. And I do wonder, it's, you know, my initial thought was, I mean, you can buy Turkish rugs at Ikea, which in itself seems ridiculous. Why would I buy a Turkish rug at Ikea? So I'm wondering if, if that's, a, you know, maybe something that I'm just taking or if that's a comment that, that you are putting into it of, you know, this westernization or of this kind of Oh, that's interesting, right, right. Something that's not necessarily ours. And I think, you know, what you were just saying on how you disorient the shape. So obviously, when you think of a rug as something that is flat, is rectangular, but the fact that it's kind of jumbled up, 
is a little uncomfortable because it's not the sense of how it's supposed to be. So again, it's not really a question, but if you have right, it's funny it ta that. that that kind of ties in with what Rich is saying, where it's rugs are meant to be soft and inviting, but your palate and the compression that's taking place. Right? There's some other dialogue, and then you have to be okay. I want to make myself. I have to make myself aware of this for my own well-being as a viewer. I want to know what's going on for this. You know what I'm saying? Well, I'm I'm excited that the work, like especially something that's still in development, is like has the ability to communicate all these ideas. I think that's really interesting. Like I think that if I was going to pair that with anything, it would be maybe the the fetishization of something that's now being produced in a mass market situation because orientalism even though like Syria is not oriental but the rugs are often referred to as oriental rugs um that is not a stranger to art history convention you know that right, was right that had its moment for sure so it is i view these rugs as like a kind of a a barrier or like a marker of otherness off the bat like that's not a marker something that of was made otherness here. that's yeah. really beautifully said Wow, we could we could camp there for a long time, I think. That is I'm glad we got to that point. I'm gonna walk away with that. A marker of otherness. That is great. No, but please finish if you were still Well, it's you know, it's something it's a visual cue and it, it does serve as that barrier. So I think that loops back to the idea of you're being protected but you're also being kept distant and then choosing to engage with I don't know, cultural and religious circumstance and customs, like it's it, it does set you aside and a lot of like the reason why i guess historically why judaism has so many rules it was intentionally to mark yourself as different to be right set right. aside from i don't know the, the goyim or whatever like that right. was that was the intention so, and it's funny with it, even within the jewish community like i to put myself through grad school i drove a delivery truck for these like mob run you know, um, car parts places. It was, it's really, I can tell, some, I can tell some stories. <laughs> I can tell some stories. But no, but like, um, I used to drive through the Hasidic part of Brooklyn, and there would be these billboards that said, if you're going to pray, pray in a, and they had like a, a name brand of the, the, the kind of prayer shawl that you should, like, if you're going to pray, you want to pray in this, like, you know, prayer shawl. And I was like, wow, that's really incredible. Like, that's kind of saying that all the other prayer shawls are really garbage. But it was really funny. I was like, they're marketing their prayer shawls as the best, right? So it's funny, like even within the communities, there's that kind of like, no, 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 you don't want to, you don't want that prayer shawl. You want to be with this is this is the one you want. This is the one that'll really get you with the conversation yeah, Gucci, going. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, um, Pat, did you have a question? No, it just made me think of. Uh, I was in Israel in '88, '89 during the first Intifada. And they had um, I see the um, Hasidic Jews. It was back when like the specials and all that kind of stuff was like in play. You know, you see here on the MTV or whatever. And I'd see the young Hasidics wearing their hats, kind of like they were in the specials, and trying to look kind of ska because like that was going on in like England or whatever. And it just made me think of. It's funny. It's, not a question. it's like we're. It's almost like within the community, we want to be. We want to be constrained within the community, but really, we don't want to be like we want to be separate as well, right? Yeah, that's what I was actually going to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's a way, like you know, at some point, everyone in their life, like when you've been raised, like whether objectively expressed or inherently expressed, like there are traditions and rituals and customs you have picked up from your parents, and I guess that's a way of people trying to preserve tradition while striving for modernity. So it's a weird. You know, transitional half space. Especially the way you like young people. I think it goes back, right? It has to begin with mom and dad. <laughs> How Freudian. <laughs> well, listen, are there any questions? I, I Oh, please, Ira. Yeah. Um, with your work, so a lot of it has to do with lighting. And what's your thought behind where, if this one's going to have harsh shadow, softer light with different points coming from each side? What's your thought behind that? It depends on the intention of the show. Um, I was in a group show with Parallelogram Gallery, and I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of what the show was, but the way we had discussed lighting the work, I wanted it to feel completely contextless, because I was realizing 
oh my gosh, they're putting the shadow in so like deep and so rich, like I am actually giving something a context. So I wanted to play around with that and I was able to achieve this image that was just stark white up on a wall, like the way that they lit it, there was like nothing. It was just that object existing and I felt like that was really interesting because there was also some work um, in the show that kind of had like a boys reference. So if we're going to talk about like the power and convention of like the rabbit. Right, that, that right, that's in, interesting, right. Yeah, and that like that rabbit like historically was used like kind of as a as a as a prop in a way. So exactly, I wanted to feel yeah. more like a, a prop. So, interesting. Yeah. Well, the, the good news is um, that this group of AAs will be having an exhibition here next uh, next fall. So um, and I'm I'm all about the lighting so we can have some fun. So uh, any other questions or? OK. I mean, well, oh. it's not a question, but it's been, I've been stuck on this idea for a while for this reading of the book, which is like a brief history of humankind. And uh, one, of the, one of the few things I took away from it was an idea called, the, called the Imagined Order. And it really is like uh, this idea that, um, you know, I bring this up because you keep talking about these binaries, but you escape from those uh, cloaking things while being protected, et cetera. But imagined order is basically an idea going forward that in order for humans collectively to move from like small bands of hunter gatherers to agrarian societies to modern man, we have to establish an imagined order. That's so interesting. This is the first like real solid document of that that we have that we in any common textbooks being Hammurabi's code, mm -hmm. right? From the, so the Babylonian Empire, the, the largest stationary group of humans that really had like a centralized economy and that was great. And so when, as I continue to see you wrestling with the ideas, I see an echo here of a national order and a struggle with that just in general. Whether they're binaries, whether it's safety, recognizing that they come from parental lineage, tradition, custom, and all of those things that are handed down to us psychically and to some degree physically um, that make up like the relationships that we have with each other and ourselves and all that stuff. So that's that not, is not a question, but no, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Like, I can't, I can't wait for us to chat a little bit more after because <laughs> I, I do genuinely love hearing people's feedback on my work, and I think that as you know, you're talking about basically shifts in organization as that's humanity has. Belief. Yeah. You can't get along if you don't have a central idea. Yeah. To like, yeah, rally around because otherwise conflict. And there's always going to be a power struggle as things like transmute. It's it's all kind of the same thing, even though maybe the subject matter changes. There's going to be a shift, and yeah, those conflicts shift. And imagine order really kind of shifts and manages like conflict, right? From a band and a small band to like conflicts within a larger group. And there's resolutions and, and rules and order that help navigate and net out like you know results, the results of conflict, like all that kind of stuff. And it's definitely trickled down into what we today would call like you know culture in various parts of the world. Yeah, it's definitely, especially with an gendered realm, it's definitely, I think, implicitly and like subconsciously communicated. There's just cues you take without even realizing, and they do come from those shifts that may have happened like thousands of years ago, and they, yeah, they just keep, it's like a snowball. Yeah. yeah so. yes. yes. Thank you, Richard, for that. That was great. Does the show have a name? Um, which show? The whole thing. Do you have a 20%? Um, it, it depends like on how they're arranged. I think uh, the next one that I will be doing uh, is going to be called Praying With My Eyes Open, just because I feel like I really want to focus on the body for oaks. I have like about 10 of them all in various stages of finish, and you can see a couple of them at my studio right now like being worked on. Is this the only one realized from that That's series? the only one realized. Yeah, the rest are kind of being developed. It's, it's a tedious process, and I really want them to have like a lot of my one regret about this is kind of the the limited patterning. I want to go crazy. I want to go off the rails. So I'm kind of developing Interesting. that. Interesting, right, right. Because I like the graphic quality of it too. But to me, that's a struggle to paint because I do rely on that. You know, the like I'm very familiar with that way of painting, so I'm trying to push myself. It was a real, um, you know, I kind of was very. Uh, lower middle class growing up. My father was a gym teacher, and when I started working for Christie's as their um, lighting and visual coordinator, one of the things I had to do, they, they sold Middle Eastern rugs. 
And you know, with all my art history, I had no idea what I was about to encounter, you know, assisting in those exhibitions. And they didn't care anything about the the layout or the whatever. They just stacked these rugs up. And these these intense communities from the Middle East would fly over because these rugs were incredibly, you know, I mean, they, they had found their way to other places in the world and they wanted to kind of assimilate them back into their cultures because they had some. But oh my goodness, it was like they didn't care anything about presentation or the light. You know, I mean, every other exhibition I was involved with, the uh, the kind of um, you know the the kind of aesthetic was really important to the to the person that was going to buy that. They didn't care at all. They just wanted to see these rugs, and so there was just stacks of rugs in a room with a, with a, just a single light on them, and they would come in and they turn the rugs inside out and look at them and this and that. And it was it was amazing for me. It was just a very um, I, I really had an appreciation for this, this kind of old world ideal of what went into that and that continued tradition and history that they felt were so important, you know what I mean? Yeah, and the, the textiles, the rugs specifically, they're um, incredibly valuable if they're authentic right. and they actually accrue value over time. Exactly, Because right. they can last for hundreds and hundreds of years and be restored almost back to new. And one of the reasons why I really, I think, gravitated towards these textiles is because number one, I kind of grew up with them around my house, but also um, they're these objects that are history holders. The patterns all mean something, and it comes from like a tradition of anaconticism, right. where it's like religiously you couldn't depict. Um, this is kind of more tied toward Islam, but it was kind of repeated a little bit in Judaism and right. also in some forms of Christianity, where you don't depict anything that is sacred or anything anything lifelike because you're trying right. to imitate kind of God's work. So it, there's this trend towards beautiful patterning and they're right. also developed by women. It was considered right. a woman's role to make these textiles. So I, I'm, you know, that's just another layer that I'm looking at it, but I have high hopes for this series. I, I can't wait to- Well, this in the beginning of them is, and, and just the way you've kind of been um, so eloquent describing where the series is going, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Hopefully they, some of them could be in our show next year. That would be great. So listen, I just want to I, I want to move on to to uh, Mira's studio because I think that would be a treat for all of us.